After a couple fantastic weeks in Ireland, the country of my family's roots, it was time to hop on the flagship carrier of the country, Aer Lingus, on board their A330-300 in business class from Dublin all the way up to San Francisco, their second longest flight at the moment, second to only their flight to Los Angeles. I actually stayed the night prior at the Radisson Blue Airport Hotel, which is a nice short walk over to both of Dublin's terminals. Terminal 2 is home to Aer Lingus, it's also home to pretty much all of the North America bound flights. Terminal 1, on the other hand, is home to pretty much all the EU flights with the exception of the Aer Lingus flights. So we're here at Terminal 2 Departures to check in for our Aer Lingus flight using their premium check-in. Once inside, the lines for Aer Lingus' check-in counters were absolutely massive for all the economy lines. Considering that the San Francisco flight leaves around noon, there's actually quite a few flights to North America, especially New York and Boston, that leave much earlier, so a lot of these economy passengers were in line for those earlier flights. Fortunately, for those passengers traveling in business class or those of the highest status of Aer Lingus' membership program, there is a premium check-in area off to the side, and the stones and wood finishings of this check-in area make it a nice welcoming place for you to start your journey. Unfortunately, there's only a couple counters, so in busier times of the day, there still can be a little bit of a line, but it only took us about 5-10 to 10 minutes to get our bags checked and head off towards security. Now the security at Dublin's Terminal 2 is actually on a floor up above the check-in area, so there are a couple escalators to go up there. One of them was tucked behind the Aer Lingus line of people waiting to check in for economy, so I headed to the other side of the terminal by the US-based carriers where the other escalator was much more easily accessible. Once you get to the top of that escalator, you're going to find the arrivals for Terminal 2, all the international arrivals just having cleared immigration. Going up one more set of escalators, we get to the main area where Dublin security is. Now for outbound passengers, there's no outbound immigration check, so the only thing is your normal TSA style security. Now for security there was actually no business class line open, so we ended up waiting in the normal line which did take us about 20 to 30 minutes to get through, so allow some extra time for that. Once you get through security and the duty free shop, you get into the main atrium of shops and restaurants. Now it's important to note that Terminal 2 is broken into two sections. They actually have the wings going to US specifically, and they have another wing going to all other destinations. This is because Dublin has what's known as US preclearance. Preclearance means that you're actually going to clear your US customs here in Dublin. So when you arrive in the United States, it's very similar to just arriving on a domestic flight. Here you can see how to track when to head to preclearance, as they only allow certain flights to actually go through at a time. Now I didn't learn until later that there is an Aer Lingus lounge outside of preclearance that I could have gone to while I waited for the San Francisco flight to be accepted into the preclearance area. In the meantime though, it was only about 30 minutes so we just grabbed a seat in the atrium until the sign above the preclearance finally showed the San Francisco flight, meaning that we were being accepted through the preclearance line and out into the US specific part of Terminal 2. The US preclearance is actually extremely easy. Once you get down there, you'll see plenty of signs pointing you exactly where you need to go, and eventually it feels just like you're transiting any other US customs like you would find in the States. So it doesn't even feel like you're in Ireland anymore. The employees are US border protection agents. They even have their own global entry line, so if you're a global entry holder, you can take advantage of that here in Dublin. When you get out of preclearance, you're going to find yourself here on the ground floor of the Terminal 2 United States Wing. Feels kind of weird being on the same level as the airplanes, but you're going to head down this long corridor which has mostly shops and a couple cafes, in addition to some of the gates, although as you'll see later, most of the gates are upstairs. Where we're heading, however, is past the SFO mural to the far end of the Terminal 2 Wing, where we find 51st and Green. It's the lounge specifically for business class passengers on these US bound flights. Now if you don't have a business class ticket, you can buy access to this lounge for about 40 euros. However, they do not accept priority pass holders. So if you are a priority pass lounge visitor, your last lounge access is pre-US preclearance. Now 51st and Green, named after the sake that we're in the US having passed US immigration, however, we're on Irish soil. So 51st, making this lounge a 51st state of sorts, and Green paying homage to Ireland. Hence the name 51st and Green Lounge. Now this lounge was a great addition to Aer Lingus in about 2016, considering that for passengers going to the US, their last chance to enter a lounge was the Aer Lingus lounge prior to US preclearance. So once passengers went through preclearance, they were on to the US part of Terminal 2, which is known for being extremely overcrowded at times. 
I will say that being on ground level here gives you a very interesting vantage point to watch the airplanes take off and land, as well as watching the airplanes enter and exit the gates here. We were right at the end of runway 28 left, which was the departure end of the runway actively in use. Now at this time of day, it was still about 10.30 in the morning, and so they did still have the breakfast spread out. At about 11.30, they switched from breakfast to lunch. The breakfast spread included a number of options, obviously since this was only the US bound flights, a lot of western options like eggs, bacon, and sausage. In addition to that, down below they had a lot of pre-made sandwiches, which is a pretty normal thing to find in the markets here, and all of the soft drinks to go along with that. In the center is the main parfait station where you'll find both yogurt and vegan yogurt, as well as a number of toppings to build your own little parfait. On the far end is some random cold cuts and cheese to go along with that. You're also going to find a porridge station where they have porridge as well as a number of toppings to go with that as well, directly adjacent to all of the bread options. Speaking of bread options, there's no shortage of pastries, both croissants, waffles, donuts, muffins and scones, all kinds of stuff that you could have to complement your coffee or tea nicely to start your day. Speaking of which, they do have a hot water machine and an espresso machine so that you can make any type of hot beverage you're looking for. And if you don't want a pastry, they do have a number of these little tea cookies that can go along with it. And if you're looking for a crafted drink, be it a hot drink or an alcoholic drink, they do have a bar here with a full service barista, so I was able to go there and get a hot vanilla latte, something that an espresso machine didn't actually offer. After that I found a spot by the window to enjoy my parfait, my latte, my sandwich, and other breakfast goodies that I was hoping would keep me nourished until I got on board my flight. As I mentioned, being at ground level, however, at the meantime I got to watch all these interesting Aer Lingus planes taxi in and out. Exciting to see so many of the green Aer Lingus A330s still around as they repaint them slowly to white. They do have places to work. Here you can see a printer you have access to as well as another room that I wasn't able to get footage of. They do also have restrooms, including one here with a shower, but I didn't take advantage of that on today's visit. Now considering you can't actually head through pre-clearance before about a couple hours before your flight, and they do start boarding about an hour before your flight, it only gives you so much time to actually be down here and explore the terminal and the lounge. So before long it was time to pack up our stuff, head back out into the terminal, and find our gate for San Francisco. Now like I mentioned, there's only a few gates that are actually downstairs. It seemed as if the narrow body aircraft were using the downstairs gates. So being that we were in an A330, we headed up our escalator to the upstairs gates. It was a little bit less crowded here although some of the gates were admittedly packed, found our gate to San Francisco and grabbed a seat. And when we first got up here, the area was absolutely packed, making it hard to find a place to sit, especially with a group of multiple people. However, it wasn't long after we got up here before a couple of these A330s pushed back for America-bound flights, and it did free up a ton of extra space for us to find seats until boarding began. Now from what I could tell, Aer Lingus didn't really have boarding groups, they did separate priority boarding for people in business class and their status members, and then general boarding after that. We were actually the very first people to board once they called for priority boarding, only those needing extra assistance were ahead of us, meaning that we had pretty much a jet bridge all to ourselves as we walked on board our airplane. Aer Lingus's business class is actually set up in a fairly unique style, alternating between a 122 and a 121 setup. This means that if you're sitting on the left side of the airplane, it's all single seats, alternating between being closer to the aisle and closer to the window. If you're sitting on the left side of the airplane, you're going to want an even numbered seat in order to have a little bit more privacy being closer to the window instead. If you're sitting in the middle section, it's two seats next to each other, regardless of what row you're in, it just depends on whether you're shifted more to the right or the left since they're slightly offset. And if you're on the right side of the airplane, it alternates between two seats next to each other and the single throne seats, which is where I'll be sitting today. If you're on the right side of the airplane traveling alone, you're going to want to be in an odd numbered seat in order to guarantee the throne seat, which gives you a lot extra space compared to all the other seats here in the business class cabin. Now looking around my seat, seat 5K, or the throne seat as it's known, I was given a pillow and a blanket, actually taken away for takeoff but handed back shortly after. Over my left shoulder I had a reading light that was dimmable and also could swivel around to aim at different things. I was given a nice bottle of Irish water inside this fancy water bottle holder. And below that we found the universal charging port along with USB charging port and the headset jack for the headphones that came with the seat as well. Adjacent to that is where we find the seat controls, where we can use one of the preset modes or adjust the leg rest and the lumbar support individually. Also had a massage setting and a setting for the mood light. 
Below that's where we find the Seatback TV remote, which pops out a fairly simple TV remote. However, like I always mention, if you're in a reclined position, it's nice not to have to lean all the way up and touch your screen. In addition to the main seat controls, they do also have the presets here on the edge of your counter just to get to the presets, massage, or mood lighting setting. Above that is one of two ginormous counters you can see here in relation to the size of my hand. On here is also where your tray table is located. By pulling the tab, you can release the tray table where it pulls down and pivots to open up in front of you. Not the biggest tray table in the world, however, I had so much counter space with this seat that it really didn't matter. Also on that counter is this nice little cubby. I ended up not needing to use it because of how much space I had, but it could be a nice space to store some toiletries or whatnot if you do have that. On the front of that console is where we found the literature pocket where I seemed to be missing a safety card, but at least I had a barf bag. Directly in front of me is the seatback TV, and underneath that is the seatback pocket, which was home to where the headphones were that they gave us with this seat. It also had this TTL abbreviation, which I had never seen before, but I assume stands for Taxi, Takeoff, and Landing, using the context. Below that's where you're going to find the footrest. Now that big cushion is for when it's in bed mode. There's no storage below the footrest, and that's because if you're not all the way in bed mode, it's got this nice incline for you to rest your feet on. Now directly to my right on the side of that countertop is a bunch of storage. First you can see is a literature pocket which can be blocked off so nothing slides out. As well as this big bin where I kept all of my chargers for the entirety of the flight. Below that is even more storage meant to hold shoes or slippers if you do have those and you're taking them on or off throughout the flight. And as if that giant counter to your left isn't enough, you also have this ginormous counter off to your right as well. You can see here, comparing my hand to the size of this one, there was more space than I could possibly know what to do with on this airplane. Perhaps the piece that I was most grateful for out of this whole seat was just having individual air vents overhead. As we settled in, the amenities began rolling in, starting with the pre-departure beverage choice. The person in front of me took the last champagne, and so I decided rather than having her go open a brand new bottle, I decided I would get an orange juice, change things up, break tradition a little bit, and keep all you guys on your toes. I also noticed with the headphones was this little donation pouch for people wanting to donate whatever they could to UNICEF to help those kids in need. Then came the amenity kit. The fabric itself felt a little bit cheaper, like the French Bee amenity kit that I got. And the amenities inside were fairly basic. Eye mask, earplugs, and socks to get comfortable. A dental kit to help you freshen up, along with Voya hand cream and lip balm as well. Unfortunately, Aer Lingus' bathrooms suffer from the big white box phenomena, where there's not really any special flooring, walls, or lighting. Just one big white box for you to use the restroom in. The only real special Aer Lingus touch came from the extra Voya amenities for hand soap and lotion. Then came time to explore the in-flight entertainment system starting with the Aer Lingus Play app which they advertise on the TV as a way to connect your personal device to the Seatback TV. You can use it to watch extra entertainment, you can also use it as a remote. Here's the Aer Lingus Play app. You can see by going in there you are able to add your flight by loading in your departure and destination city and flight number. It can load that up for you. From there, you're able to figure out how to connect to the Seatback Entertainment. However, unfortunately, on this flight today, when I tried to scan the QR code, it said the pairing with Seatback was not available on this flight. So I decided, after all, I didn't really need my phone because I also just had my Seatback TV in and of itself, so I could use that at my fingertips and watch anything I needed. Starting off with the movies here, you can see they have a large amount of genres where you can click on that and see a wide selection. All in all, I found Aer Lingus' movie selection to be pleasantly sufficient. There is more than enough movies to watch under all kinds of categories, and if you were to fly Aer Lingus frequently, you wouldn't have a problem learning out of things to watch. TV shows are more of the same, maybe not as wide of a selection as you'll find with some of the movies. However, once again, there is still a good amount of categories, and within each category, there is still plenty of stuff to watch. One thing I do like is when you do open these TV shows, they do have full seasons, sometimes multiple seasons of some of these shows, so you're really able to follow the storyline, especially if you've never seen that story before. Then going on to the music, there was a little bit less genres when it comes to the audio, but within each of those genres there was still plenty of different music options. And while there weren't necessarily a ton of games, there were a few different categories of games at least, so if you were trying to play a game, they probably had something you would have liked. The last entertainment sector was the Kid Zone, which is the number of movies, TV shows, audio, and games, same categories that we just went through, however these ones are specifically curated with material for kids, so that if you are trying to keep a kid entertained, there are things specifically for them. 
They do also have a connections tab, although it won't be available until closer to landing. They also had this tab here for menus and info. I couldn't really find the menu for today's flight, but they did have all these short little videos about Aer Lingus history, as well as the moving map feature accessible through here as well. Unfortunately, Aer Lingus' in-flight map feature is a non-interactive map, where you kind of just leave it open, it'll cycle through a few different views, but unfortunately, there's no way for you to zoom in or control the map in any way. All of this, of course, is controllable with that CPAC TV remote, which is nice if you are sitting back at a distance or reclined. I also noticed that they had picture-in-picture -picture mode later on in the flight, so you could continue to watch your show while you searched for your next. And while it may not have been able to connect to my CPAC TV, I still did have access to the Aer Lingus app entertainment from my personal device. From there, they did have movies and TV shows that weren't available on CPAC TV, including different categories of TV shows and movies that weren't otherwise available. So I did enjoy scrolling through there to see just what they had available. Fortunately, everything was sort of the same on the CPAC TV and your personal device. So it does make it easy if you do want to watch something on the other device to find it and see if it is actually available on the CPAC TV. In addition, something that I found available on the personal device, but not on the CPAC TV, was that you could add different shows and different audios to your favorites, making them easier to find later. Then came Aer Lingus' Wi-Fi, which I actually got this clip just after takeoff, but by connecting to the Wi-Fi, you get to the main website where you can purchase plans, view the meals or the in-flight magazines, as well as connecting to the screen. Here you can see the prices for the Wi-Fi, the full flight, full strength, costing just over 22 euros for the entire flight. Interestingly enough, there was still a 12 hour timer, however, considering the flight was less than 12 hours, that did mean I had Wi-Fi for the entire flight.
Pretty much as soon as we got in the air, the flight attendants came around with these codes for free Wi-Fi for business class passengers. And oh boy, was I bummed that I had already paid 23 euros in order to get full flight Wi-Fi. So I guess if anything, I gotta be working on my patience. They also came around and passed out these in-flight menus. These are the westbound menus for flights departing Dublin, and Irish people actually have pretty common gluten and lactose intolerance. So the menu actually has a lot of gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegan options, all that were super well-crafted. And actually, for the first time ever, the plane ran out of vegetarian options before they ran out of the meat options. I started off with their signature cocktail, which was just a champagne with some raspberry puree in it. Also came with some drink biscuits and some onion jam along with that. As I worked my way through Talladega Nights, they came by with the placemats, which also had that Aer Lingus shamrock written on it as well. To kick off the meal service, I decided to start off with the Jameson Ginger. This is something that had become pretty familiar to me over the last couple weeks. For the starter, I went with the Bloody Mary prawns and the fennel quinoa salad. Every single bit of this was absolutely delicious. I also enjoyed the continuity of brand with the shamrock not only on the placemat, but also on all the silverware as well. For my entree, I was going to go with the roasted cauliflower. From what I heard, it was absolutely incredible. I ended up going with the lamb shoulder because they actually ran out of the cauliflower before reaching my seat. So I was a little bummed by that considering the lamb shoulder was just okay. I really wish I could have tried that cauliflower. And to wrap it all up, the dessert was this nice little raspberry pastry cake, and I decided to go with a cup of coffee as well. By far though, the highlight of having the throne seat, you can see here, even with the tray table pulled out, I got an empty counter to my left side while still being able to have two drinks and my laptop on my right side getting plenty of work done throughout the flight. Now considering this was a fully daytime flight, I didn't actually get any sleep, but I did explore the seat a little bit. This is the fully upright position, nothing too special, but then it does go into the relaxed position, which most of these seats do have on airplanes nowadays, which is kind of an in-between preset between fully sitting and fully laying down. Of course, it does go fully flat here if you do want to set that up. The seat goes fully flat and it's pretty hard, so luckily with the pillow and the blanket, you can customize it a little bit. Here you can see it set up with that pillow and blanket. I actually ended up unreclining it a little bit. I found it to be a little bit too flat even with that pillow. I will say the seat itself is not the most comfortable and the footwell in these throne seats is tiny. You can see here I can't really move my feet left or right or anything. So that is probably drawback number one here of these throne seats just because that footwell has to fit between the two seats in front of you. Most people did get some sleep, however I opted not to sleep just because it was a fully daytime flight. Instead I explored the galley where they actually had a few snack options, both sweet and savory, as well as some extra bottles of water. They also came around and gave us these vanilla ice creams. They did have some vegan options as well. As we made our way over the Pacific Northwest, about an hour and a half from San Francisco, they came around with our final meal, and this may be one of the best things I've had on board an airplane. This was the vegetarian option, which was a lime marinated halloumi with Dublin cheddar and barbecue sauce on a nice brioche bun. Completely delicious. And the desserts on the side were all pretty good, including that chocolate cream puff eclair kind of thing. After that wrapped up, they came around with the first and only hot towel of the flight, which was nicely scented at the very least. It wasn't long after that last meal, however, that they came through the cabin, collected everything, and prepared for our descent into San Francisco, putting our total flight time right about 10 and a half hours for the full journey.
gentlemen, children, you're all very welcome to a beautiful sunny afternoon in San Francisco. The local time has just gone 4 p.m. We're just running a few minutes behind our scheduled time of arrival. We do apologize for this. We do hope it doesn't make be too, too much for just... Ten and a half hours later, we have arrived in San Francisco, and I couldn't help but feel like this flight was somewhat special, just because, as an Irish American, I've never actually had the chance to go to Ireland until now. It's always been a trip that I've planned, and I've always pictured myself flying Aer Lingus, so I'm super glad I was able to make that happen. Especially because, over time, as Aer Lingus has gone in and out of financial troubles, the West Coast US routes are some of the first ones to go, places like San Francisco, LA, and Seattle. So I was super glad that I was able to get on this flight when I did go on this trip, especially in the business class cabin. Personally, I do think that it resembles more of a more budget airline as far as international business class goes. The seat isn't the most comfortable, however, I am always grateful to have the throne seat and have a ton more space. To have that option at no extra cost was super special, as Swiss Air charges an extra couple hundred bucks for it. So the seat I was grateful for, although with two seats next to each other, it would have been a little bit of a different experience. As far as the soft product goes, the crew was wonderful and the food was some of the best I've had, especially if you have dietary restrictions. Perhaps the best part though about flying from Ireland to the United States is that US pre-clearance because what that means is here as we get off the airplane, there's no immigration. You'll see here, this is the boarding gate for the return flight to Dublin as we just deplane just like we're getting off any other domestic flight and head straight out to baggage claim. No immigration needed because we already cleared our immigration out in Dublin. There's pre-clearance available in a few countries around the world and Aer Lingus operates out of two of those airports, both Shannon and Dublin out in Ireland. So super fortunate and saves a ton of time on arrival. Now luckily they do have some signs pointing you to baggage claim, but as you walk past the United Polaris Lounge and out past the TSA security checkpoint, you're just in the main check-in area and it's easy to become a little bit disoriented. Now if you follow signs for baggage claim, it'll take you past the check-in desks, or you actually have to head downstairs down an escalator to baggage claim. Down here you're going to find baggage claims for all the other destinations that have pre-clearance. As far as the airlines that fly into San Francisco, that's only going to be the Canadian flights and the Irish flights. You can even see baggage claim 3 labeled as domestic arrivals since technically since we cleared US pre-clearance we departed from US soil. Now because there was no immigration we ended up getting to baggage claim pretty quickly and waiting for our bags just a little bit longer. Finally there was a full plane full of people waiting for their bags before they all started coming out but luckily we got our bags and got out still quicker than if we had to go through immigration here at San Francisco. But until next time safe travels and I'll see you guys on the next trip.